Good morning, church. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're about to, we're going to start the service, or we'll start today's service with um, prayer. So, let's close our eyes and let's bow our heads. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you for the breath of life in us. We thank you for the strength in our bodies. Thank you for the strength in, in our bones. We thank you for good health. We thank you for watching over us. We thank you for providing for us. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us, Lord. And we thank you that we are able to be here to praise you. We thank you that we are able to be here to worship you, Lord. Father, we ask that you receive our worship, you receive our praise. Be, be, be magnified, Lord. Take, take pleasure in what we offer to you today. And Lord, as we listen to the word, as we go through the service, Father, we, we thank you for the words that is going to come through. We thank you for the way it's going to impact our lives. We thank you for the changes that it's going to make. We thank you because your word is going to take root in our hearts. It's going to be a fruit in our lives in Jesus' name. And Lord, we commit every other part of the service into your hands. We commit um, the pastors that's going to come up here and teach. We commit the kids' service, commit rock. We commit um, the marshals, multimedia, the choir, every department that, that plays a part in how today's going to one, we commit everything into your holy hands, Lord. Take absolute control. Take absolute control over everything, over every thought, over every word that's going to be spoken here today, Lord. Let your name be glorified in this service. And as we leave here and as we go into our lives um, throughout the rest of today and throughout the rest of the week, Lord, let us reflect you. Let us, let us, let us um, act like you. Let us be more like you in our daily um, life in our daily happenings, Lord. Be glorified by everything that we give you here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Enjoy the service. Somebody celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. He's alive. Celebrate Jesus. Somebody give him praise. There's nobody like him.
Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. We're about to do a new song. Very simple. It says, no other God can be called a father, a friend, redeemer. We have only one God. The Alpha and Omega. The great I am that I am. There's nobody like him. Father, we give you praise. We love you, Lord. No other God can be called a father. No other God can be called a friend. No other God can be called redeemer. No other God can me back again in our love. Yes, how we love your name, Jesus. You're the beautiful one. We love your name. Yes, how we love your name, Jesus. You're the beautiful one. We love your name. Father, we love God can be called a father. No other God can be called a no father. No other God can be called a friend. Redeemer. No other God can be called redeemer. No other God's coming back again. No other God coming back again.
Somebody give him praises worthy, Lord. Father, we exalt you. We will exalt you. Cause you alone deserve it. Somebody lift up your voice and give him praise. It's worthy of our praise. Nobody, nobody, nobody like you.
As we do, I'd like us to pray in particular for our next generation. These are our children who are to grow up to be our next leaders, our pastors, our teachers, our judges, our doctors, our inventors, our footballers, our lawyers. However, with the current spirit of violence that's sweeping through our nation, there's an attack on our children, our next generation preventing them from becoming what they're destined to be and taking them away from God. God has commanded us to pray for our children 
and to teach them about his laws and his deeds. This is essential for us to receive the revival that we are seeking. Psalm 78, verses, one, verses 4 to 7. I'll just read that out. We will not hide from that, we will not hide them from their children, telling them to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born that may, that may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. On a personal note, despite the fact that my mother is a pastor and I've essentially grown up in the church, there were times growing up that I strayed and got involved in bad company, especially during my secondary school days and my uni days. But I am certain that it was the prayers of my parents that kept me out of jail and out of the coffin. So today, as we pray for a revival in this nation, let us adopt the children of this nation and pray for the next generation. But before we do, I'd like to read out the names of each child that was under, that was 20 and under that has been killed this year as part of the gun and knife violence in this country. So we can use them as a point of contact as we pray for all the children in this nation and remember the reason why we're constantly praying. Steve Navarez Jara, he was 20. He was stabbed on New Year's Day in Islington. Dami Odeyingbo, he was 18 and stabbed in Bromley. Hassan Oskan, he was 19 and he died of multiple stab wounds in Barkin. Sabri Chibani, 19, stabbed in Streatham. Promise in Kenda, 17, stabbed on Valentine's Day in Canning Town. Lewis Blackman, 19, stabbed in Kensington. Sadiq Muhammad, 20, stabbed in Camden. Abdi Karim Hassan, 17, stabbed in Camden. Kelva Smith, 20, stabbed in Croydon. Kelvin Odunui, stabbed in Wood Green, only 19. Joseph William Torres, 20. He was shot in Northampton. Lyndon Davis, he was 18. He was stabbed in Chadwell Hill. Tanisha Melbourne Blake, she was 17. Died by drive-by shooting in Tottenham. Aman Shaku, he was 16 and he was shot in Northampton. And then there was Israel. Okunshola, he was 18 and he was stabbed in Hackney. Each one of these children have left behind grieving parents, some of whom are our neighbours. So church, please let's arise and let's pray for each of these children. Let's pray for their families. Let's pray that God comforts them at this time. Let's pray that God arises in this nation. That as we pray for a revival, let his spirit run through this nation. Pray that God will use our children as his tools to bring about this revival in this nation. And that the enemy shall set them loose and not use them for violence. Pray that violence shall not be the portion of our children, but their lives shall be full of joy and of peace. Pray that God. 
God shall fill them with his spirit, that he shall change hearts and minds of violence to those of love and peace. Pray that peace shall reign over this nation, and not just in relation to the gun and knife crimes, but also in relation to our international relations with countries like Russia and Iran. Let's pray for peace, church. Father Lord, we just give you all the glory. We worship you, O Lord. We say thank you for your God of love. We say thank you, Lord, for your peace. We pray, Father Lord, that your peace, Father Lord, shall reign in this nation, O Lord. That, Father Lord, as you bring about your revival, which we know is coming, O Lord, that it shall bring about peace, O Lord. It shall bring about joy, O Lord, in this nation, O Lord. We pray, Father Lord, that your spirit, O Lord, shall flow through each household, O Lord. It shall flow through our communities, O Lord, and it shall bring about the peace, O Lord, that we are seeking, O Lord. O Father Lord, that our children, O Lord, shall know peace, O Lord. Violence no longer shall be their portion, O Lord. That, Father Lord, they shall grow up, Father Lord, and fulfill your purpose, O Lord. They shall grow up and fulfill your destiny for them, O Lord. Oh, we give you glory, O Lord. We say thank you, for you are a good God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Thank you, church. Please take your seats and listen to Seven News. Hi, my name's Anne and welcome to this week's 7 News. In preparation for our annual Kids First Sunday, we are looking for young instrumentalists from the ages of 7 to 13. If your child plays an instrument and is interested, please register your child before the 5th of May as auditions will be taking place on the 6th of May from 2pm. Please do not register your child if they are already taking part in our dance, drama or choir groups. All children will need to be available from the 14th to the 16th of September for Kids First Weekend. says it's more blessed to give than to receive. If you're giving by card, please provide the following. Expiry date, CSC security code, which is the three digits on the back of your card, contact number or email address in case there are any issues with processing. If you're giving by check, please provide the following. The date, signature, contact number or email address in case there are any issues with processing. If you're giving by cash, please ensure to seal the envelope to avoid coins falling out. To add gift aid to your giving, please fill in the back of the offering envelope once. Also, if you have moved homes, please remember to give us your change of address. Always remember to write your name or JH code on the envelope if you require a statement of giving. Couples Weekend Away takes place from the 4th to the 7th of May at Chesford Grange in Warwick. To register, please send an email to tightknots at jesushouse.org.uk. The Esther's Uncommon Woman Conference will be held from Thursday the 24th of May to Saturday the 26th of May 2018. To purchase tickets, please visit uncommonwomanconference.co.uk. 
you have lost something in the church in the last three months, please visit the front of house to make further inquiries. Alternatively, please send an email to facilities at jesushouse.org.uk describing your item and we will be sure to get back to you. That's it for this week's 7 News. For a quick recap, please take a look on screen now. You can re-watch 7 News on the Jesus House website or on YouTube. We are also very social. Our handle is at Jesus House UK. Once again, my name is Anne. Thank you for watching 7 News. Have a blessed week. Good morning, church. Um, my name is Bode. Um, this is my wife, Kemi. Um, we're here to speak to you about the couple's weekend away. So obviously we're from um, Tight Knots, the marriage ministry in the church. Um, did want to say one or two things. We've already said a lot with the, the clip on, on the video, so we wouldn't want to rehash that. What we really wanted to, um, to bring to your notice is more around the benefits of spending that weekend together with other couples in the church. Um, over that period. Do you want to say something about? Yeah, so um, our vision really at Jesus House and Tight Knots Marriage Ministry is to support couples as they build Christ-centered marriages that will be a light to the world and um, a legacy for future generations. Couples Weekend Away has been going for about 22 years now. This is the 20th one that we're doing. And we're really looking forward to hosting every couple um, who comes to Jesus House. We're going to Chesford, Chesford Grange, which is in Warwickshire. And if there are just three things I wanted to say about Couples Weekend Away. Firstly, it gives you an opportunity to get away from all the, what's the word, um, frenetic pace of life. Um, just to be able to hang out and just bond with each other. I think the second thing as well is we've been married 16 years this year. And we've been so blessed by the fact that we've actually been at Couples Weekend Away every year since we got married. So there are lots of things that we learned from Pastor Ifi and Pastor Agu and all the other pastors as well in the early years of our marriage. Um, I think the other thing that I said at the first service, but I think some people came to me and said, we're definitely not coming because we don't want another baby, <laughs> is that Couples Weekend Away, as at the one we had in Portugal, we officially have six babies yes. that came out of that retreat. And we want to celebrate that as well. So if you want a baby called Chesford Grange, <laughs> wear your crew. But apart from that, if you don't want a baby, if you want, um, using Olu's terms from the first service, if you want an intimate marriage, um, definitely it's also an opportunity to come with your spouse. Sorry. So, so we're, we're going to ask um, two couples who've been on Couples Weekend Away to join us now. Um, Jill, yes, Jill and Yao Kanga. And Denby and Anthony Williams. <laughs> Yao has come hot, hot feet from, from the parking lot to make sure he, he shares uh, his experiences. So what we want to do really is to get to know a bit um, about their experiences and see what we can learn from, from that. So um, Anthony and Denby, how long have you been married? Uh, one year, 10 months. That's right to get A lot of precision there. And Yao and Jill? 22 and a half years. Ooh. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So just tell us your experience of Couples Weekend Away. How's it been a benefit to you? Or what has really come out for you from attending Couples Weekend Away? Um, I think for me, before I even started, before I attended the first Couples Weekend Away, which was last year, um, Mrs. Rosetum used to come to me and ask me to adopt a couple, pray for a couple whilst I was still single. So for me, for the years leading up to me attending or being married and being able to attend, I used to pray for the couples I used to attend that you know, God would better their marriages and all of that. And then when I finally got the opportunity when I got married um, to go last year, it was really amazing. It was a great opportunity for us to learn more about ourselves. And I think my most, the most um, fun part for me was the women's only session. And in that session, you can talk about literally anything. 
anything, I promise you. And it's like a complete safe haven. You can talk about sex, you can talk about love, you can talk about struggling with your husband, with your roles, and that was definitely my, my highlight, just Thank being you. able to have that space. Thank you. Anthony? Um, I also think for us it was a big investment as well, because we were very young, and um, it took me off my autopilot mood where I mm -hmm. just live my own way of life. But gave me the understanding that I, I've actually got a partner now, that I've got to live this life and do this journey with. And um, as my wife said, I enjoyed the men's only session as well, <laughs> which we were able to talk about anything yes. with Pastor Badge, um, yes. which you have no clue of. <laughs> so it was really nice. Great, so the men only and women only session for you. Thank you. Yao and Jill, over to you. Um, well, last year, when we went last year, we had been married 21 and a half years. And although I wanted to go, I was a bit hesitant um, because I was thinking, you know, it's easy to fall into a routine after 21 years. And uh, but I said to Jay, let's go, let's go anyway. We, we would never been into one before. And I think it was really, for me, it was an eye-opener because um, of the various sessions that were run, it was very successful. It was good hearing from both of you, hearing from Pastor Bajo, and Pastor Shola was there too, and the main session. Uh, it, was, it was an eye-opener, and you, you realize that probably I don't, what I think I know, in fact, I don't really know what I think I know. I, I'm learning new things, even after 21 and a half years, and for me, it was an eye-opener. Jill? Ask him what he learned when I go home. <laughs> God bless him. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, I really I liked the way that you organised it, you and the other members of the Tight Knots team, because there was time to to relax. There was time to think. There was a lot of reflection, which I think sometimes, as Yao said. When you've been married quite a while, it's like, yeah, he's cool, I know him, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it gave me a different view. Of, I really love him more now, I can honestly say that. And it's um, just a blessing. So, uh, praise God. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, oh, no, no, don't give the mic away yet. <laughs> so, um, if we said to you, you've got the congregation out here, you've got people listening online, what is the most significant thing you would want to tell them? What's, why would you want them to be at Couples Weekend Day Away 2018? Um, personally, for me and my wife, I think it's quite impactful and it's cancelled. Um, it's a new journey that we started when we gave our vows and for everything you need counsel and guidance to walk that journey. And as the Bible says that um, where there's no counsel, um, plans fail. And uh, what the Couples Weekend Away has been able to do is provide a platform where we could gain counsel out of our own self and out of our own understanding, but with people like you and all the brilliant people that shared their ideas with us. Thank you very much. Um, I think it doesn't matter how many years you've been married, I definitely think it would change your marriage. It changed us, and at the time we went, we hadn't even been married up to a year. Everything that we learned there, we've put it into practice, or we've tried to put it into practice. I've literally been counting down for the next one since we left. I was just like, we have to go for the next one, we have to go every year. It would definitely change your marriage. It would change how you think about certain things, especially stuff like your roles, you know, certain mentalities you've had about marriage. You get there and realize, oh, actually, it's, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, everybody's different, and then you can create your own marriage in a godly way, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, personally, for me, it, it did help me to get out of the routine. Well, uh, so it's a learning thing. It's a learning curve. Like you said, it doesn't matter how long you've been married. You, you keep learning from other people, meeting other couples. And it, it was that, for that, I would, I would say, recommend yeah, I would recommend it. And it, gives, it gave me a lot of things to consider. Um, you can't get into a rut because the devil wants to kill you and destroy everything that God has given you. So I think it's a very good time to, to talk to people, other people. Other people are 
you can learn so much. I learned a lot, and um, I really encourage anybody to go, um, not just to get away from the busyness of life, although that's nice, but actually to have time that you feel blessed that so much preparation has gone into um, to making it a success that you, I felt so blessed that it was done for me. And most of my life I'm running around doing for others, so it was excellent. I would encourage you to go. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. We have a desk outside, and um, I think we mentioned at the first service as well that if there's any couple in here who really wants to go, but they might be a bit challenged to come and have a chat with us. Since the first service, we've had somebody else come up and actually pay for space for a couple. Thank you. Gonna appreciate Kemi and Body and Tight Nuts. They're doing an excellent job. Please, if you're if you're a gentleman in this church, you treat your wife or your uh, girlfriend on the way to being a wife properly. Uh, I just like the way they all help their ladies down the stairs without any prompting. So please. You don't walk in front of your wife. You open the doors for her. That's, you know, you honor her. It's not that she's a weaker vessel um, in terms of for honoring me. If he hasn't been doing it, it's an act of faith. He will start doing it from now. Go on. I appreciate Kemi and Body and Tight Knots and what they do. Amen. Amen. Um, this music ministry is amazing. Seriously. Um, Job's, Job, Job was awesome in worship um, today, and we thank God for his life. But I, I just want to thank God for uh, our instrumentalists, because today they took it to another level. So I don't know where everybody's gone. Where are you guys? Yeah? Michael, come. Michael, come. Let's, let's appreciate you. Where, where is, where's Lex? Where's David? Where's Wale? Ire? Come. Come. Let's appreciate you. Come. We just want to appreciate you. I don't do this all the time, but we want to appreciate you. You guys, you guys are serious. Lex, you guys are serious. And David is somewhere. Yeah? It's somewhere. David is somewhere. And, uh, and Wale on the sax. We just... Go on, appreciate these guys. These guys are serious. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm on Tuesday last week, um, some sort of emergency meeting was called in Tottenham. Uh, key pastors, uh, key youth leaders, uh, representation from the council, um, and some parachurch ministries. And the meeting was called just to try and craft a, a response from the church to what is happening on our streets. And didn't, didn't Kashope, that's, that, yeah, didn't he pray so well about what's happening on our streets? Um, and, and I was asked to chair the meeting. And the meeting went quite well um, as the church started to come together um, for a coordinated and concerted response to what's happening on, on our streets in some of our boroughs. And um, right after the meeting, it happened that uh, Tanisha, Tanisha Melbourne, um, the 17-year-old girl who was shot in the drive-by shooting, that night was her nine nights um, that's a celebration of her life and so we decided to go there uh, her mom asked if we would come and pray for the family and so we went to the community center in Tottenham 400 500 young people um, in there um, and it was interesting that in the midst of the music and the eating and everything we got a chance to talk about God, talk about God's love, talk um, and pray for the family. We met 
Tanisha's mom, Sharon. Um, and I haven't seen such dignity and grace in mourning um, in a long time as I saw with her, met her brothers as well. Um, and out of that meeting, there have come a few things, uh, short, medium, and long-term responses of the church to what's happening on our streets. And I hope you appreciate that it is purely spiritual first. There are a lot of challenges in the natural, you know, the distrust of the police in some of the communities, the breakdown of the family, absentee fathers, um, the absence of uh, after-school clubs or youth centers, a lack of funding in, 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 in those areas. There, there, there are challenges in those areas that has created a room uh, for this kind of violence on our streets. In some areas, some serious poverty that you wouldn't believe exists in London. Um, uh, challenges with schools in some areas. There, there are problems, but at the root of everything, it's a spiritual problem. It's from the pits of hell. It's a bloodthirsty spirit. It's a spirit that wants to sacrifice the lives of young people uh, and, and shed their blood. And before we deal with it naturally, we must deal with it spiritually. Um, and there are short, medium, and long-term plans that, that we started to put together at that meeting. Um, one of the um, short, immediate plans was to increase the level of praying in our churches because we understand that it is spiritual. So we have to increase the level of prayers in our churches. So all around the country, um, churches, Methodist, Anglican, Baptist, Pentecostal, Evangelical, will be praying today. And, and Kashupai has done a good job of that, so I won't do that as I did in the first service. Uh, a, a second response in terms of prayer is to actually pray in certain hot spots. And um, four areas have been chosen. Uh, Tottenham, uh, Croydon, Shepherd's Bush, and um, I think it's uh, Hackney. Um, and the idea is to encourage the church, uh, what, ev starting from next Sunday, every Sunday, uh, encourage as many from the church in the city who will come to these areas and pray in those areas. Um, it's coordinated. The borough commanders in those areas are on board. Um, there'll be a police presence to support it. Um, and the idea is that we understand spiritually that wherever the soles of our feet tread upon, we possess. The idea is to reclaim our streets and our communities in the city back from the enemy. And so there is a deep spiritual dimension to praying in those troubled, troubled areas. But then there's also a physical dimension, a natural dimension in showing the communities that are grieving and hurting that the church is relevant and that the church cares. One of the things that came out of going to Tanisha's nine, nine nights was that they saw the church. You know, we came in, we prayed with them, you know, we were, our presence was felt and we showed we cared. And, and we must send that message out to the community that the church is not absent. The church is not invisible. The church cares. The church is hurting too. Um, and the church is doing something. And that will send that message. It also sends a message to those that we need to engage uh, with regards to moving forward. Those who are in authority. It sends a message to them, and, and it confirms what we have been saying to them, that the most cohesive unit in our communities now is the church. And frankly, you and I know that the church is God's solution to the problems of this world. So we'd like to encourage you to come to all four, uh, or pick one that might be near your area, and come. And for an hour, just join brothers and sisters uh, to reclaim our streets, to pray, to make declarations and, and to show the church is united in its response to what is happening on our streets. The, 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 is that okay? Yeah? Amen. So next week, uh, we've chosen Sunday as the day for these things because we're out anyway on Sunday. We're already in church on Sunday. And so we just have to add an extra two, three hours as a sacrifice um, so that we can be a part of this. Amen. So um, next week, Sunday, we'll be in Tottenham. Um, so as many of you as can come to Tottenham, 
um, uh, in, in the afternoon. We'll find out the exact time. I'm not sure. I think it's 4 or 4.30 or something. Doc will tell us before the service is over. As many of you as can come to Tottenham, uh, we meet at the town hall. It's going to take an hour. We just reclaim the streets. We make declarations. Uh, we let the community know that we care. Um, and the church does this together as the church. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you for the entrance of your word. The entrance of your word brings light. It brings liberty. It brings deliverance. And we're expecting that that will be the case, Heavenly Father, and more in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. <coughs> Amen. I started a series um, uh, which we tagged the fiery darts of Satan, the fiery darts of the enemy. It was really taken from Paul's teaching to the church at Ephesus, especially Ephesians, the sixth chapter. In that scripture, Paul highlights the contention that we face as Christians. He tells us that we wrestle, but we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not the challenge. We wrestle against an organized hierarchy of wickedness that has one plan and one plan alone. That plan is to prevent you from becoming who God wants you to be, prevent you from entering the fullness of God's plans for your life, pre prevent, you, prevent God's purposes from coming to pass in your life. Jesus puts it as clearly as, as can be put in John the 10th chapter and the 10th verse. The thief comes to steal to kill and destroy, he says, before he makes that declaration that gladdens our heart, that I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So this organized hierarchy of wickedness and evil that Paul highlights, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, arrayed against the Christian to stop the Christian from ent entering the fullness of what God has for him or her. But then Paul goes on to encourage us by letting us know that we can overcome this organized hierarchy of evil. And we do so by putting on an armor as we go into this fight. And he bases that armor on the armor that the people saw in their day-to-day -day lives that the Roman soldiers wore. And so he goes through this armor, or different parts of it, but then in verse 16 of that, of that chapter, he talks about, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And I explain that that particular armor is absolutely necessary. It's interesting that he says, above all. Uh, when you've worn all these other parts of the armor, then you must take this shield of faith. Because without the shield of faith, you won't be able to extinguish or quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And we spoke about darts, the, the weapon of choice of the enemy that he launches at Christians, hoping to hit them with this dart. His intention is that, of course, the dart will kill, it will maim, it will wound, it will harm, um, and in the process, hinder. But the darts are interesting darts because they're not just darts, they're fiery darts. And, and they're darts, they're weapons that, that can do one of two, two things or both. The impact of the dart can kill, can destroy, can maim and wound. And if that doesn't happen, the fiery re re refers to the combustible part of the dart. And the idea is that it will catch fire and burn the victim. And Paul says, this is what the enemy uses against us. And we started talking about these fiery darts. Last week, we spoke about the fiery dart of fear. This week, I want to talk about the fiery dart of, <coughs> of rejection. Facing or dealing with rejection is part of life. You can't exist in this world without encountering rejection. But God's plan when we encounter rejection is that we raise the shield of faith. And so the fiery dart does not find 
its target in our hearts or in our lives. Unfortunately, because most, some of us didn't have the shield of faith then, didn't know about the shield of faith, hadn't done what was necessary to, to, to put on that armor, the fiery darts of the enemy of rejection have hit their targets. Sadly, in some cases, have caused serious wounds and hindered the work of a child of God. We face rejection when a, a parent that should nurture a child rejects a child. A child struggles to please a parent by measuring up to a standard and constantly fails. That child faces rejection. Someone goes to an interview for a job, fails the interview, and doesn't get the job. That person has to deal with that rejection. A spouse is told that he or she is no longer loved by their, by their partner and that the marriage is over. Even worse, when the spouse goes on to marry another person, that person has to deal with rejection. Children, while growing up, growing up constantly experience rejection in various circumstances. Sometimes it's because they're not allowed into a peer group. They face rejection. Sometimes it's the circumstances in which they grow up. Circumstances that kind of make their family different from the other families. They deal with rejection. Sometimes it's just a, as a result of a physical attribute. And you know, children in a playground can be harsh. As a result of a physical attribute that they have, something in their physical, in their physical being, they face rejection. You face rejection when a child who you loved and sacrificed for turns his or her back on you. When a friend chooses another friend over you. When a friend betrays you. When a parent abandons the family, a father walks away from a family, the children in that family will have to deal with rejection. When a sibling is favored over you, when you were in a relationship that you thought would lead to a marriage, but suddenly the other person backs out, you face rejection. The list is endless of the circumstances where that fiery dart of rejection is thrown at us. And rejection can cause very deep wounds that cut deep into the psyche of a person, often changing how a person views himself or herself, how he or she relates to others, and even how he or she views God. It can affect a person's ability to achieve God's plans and purpose, to fulfill destiny, to live a rich and fulfilling life. Rejection can be very painful. And the enemy knows the capacity for rejection to hinder a person in this walk of life. And so he throws these fiery darts one after the other, hoping that one will find their target, hoping that one dart will lodge in the heart of a person and the poison of re rejection will seep through and eventually prevent that person from living the fullness of life. He hopes that rejection will steal, will kill, and destroy. His aim is the heart of the person. He understands perfectly what that wise king says in Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The message puts it this way. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. He knows that if he can get the poison of rejection into the heart of a person, it will affect how the person thinks. And if it affects how the person thinks of himself or herself, it will, it will eventually affect how the person lives life out. For he understands very clearly what the Bible says, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He knows that there's a direct correlation, a, 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 a relationship between rejection and a low self-esteem. You see, rejection will do one of two things to a person. It will either destroy the person's esteem or it will make the person rebellious. You know, I, I know because I, I, I suffered rejection 
from my father as I grew up. Thank God for my mother in that instance. Because you see, I, I, I had a personality that was combustible. And my father thought that personality needed to be tamed and he didn't trust that personality. And so as I grew up, my father would tell me that I was the black sheep of the family. He would do some things that I can't forget till today. I'll never forget. We would go out, and my father had a briefcase. The briefcase, I guess, was his version of the signet ring that somebody had in the Old Testament or his staff. It was him. And we'd go out to public places. The briefcase had all his documents. And he would take the briefcase, bypass me, and give the briefcase to my younger brother. That thing sent a message to me. He doesn't trust you. And he would say that if I give this to Agu, he's going to lose it. So he'd give it to my brother to keep. He did this over and over again. And every time the message that was sent to me was rejection. I'll never forget, my father was, was we went out to lunch. He was in insurance. These things I'm telling you happened 40 years ago. I still remember them vividly. We went out to lunch. I so desperately wanted to impress him. We sat with two or three men from the insurance industry, top of their game. We're having lunch. The first thing I did that irritated him was I ordered two main meals. But I was a student. And I knew I was going back to hunger so in my boarding school. So I thought I better fill up. And I could tell he was irritated. And so, you know, they, they started talking. The conversation was way above my head. But I felt I had to impress my father. So at some point, I thought I could get him involved in the conversation. I can't remember what I said, but it must have been so foolish that one of the men looked at me and laughed. He's a, he's, he's, I mean, Chizor knows the man. He's gone now to be, you know, he's passed away. And he said to me, oh, obviously insurance is not by osmosis. And my father laughed. It was a dagger that I carried for 40 years. I understand rejection. I lived trying to please my father till I was 40 years old. And every time I tried to measure up, just as I got to the goalpost, guess what he did? He moved the goalpost. Now he's an 80-something-year-old man who can't stop talking about his first son. My father boasts a lot. You know, you must be careful the name that you give a child. My father's traditional name is Jomike, and in my village dialect, it means praise me. My father just loves praise. And he boasts a lot. So we hear him, and I, sometimes I just say, God, just forgive him, please. Don't, don't get me involved in, in this is issue. He's in the departure lounge of life. I, I, have, I have some time to live by God's grace. So I don't believe what he's saying. Because if you hear my father now, nothing can be better than me. My son, Agu, didn't you know? Oh, my son, Agu, haven't you heard? My son, oh, yes, he's doing an amazing work. You know, someone said to him, how come you let Agu get, get, go, go into church? We thought he would follow you in insurance. They said to him, you must have had foresight to know that what he's doing by the grace, well, I'm saying by the grace of God, he didn't say that, would be successful. He said, oh, yes, yes, you know, we take these things into consideration when we make decisions about his life. <laughs> I said, really? When I got involved in church, he told me that I would be a charity case. That after all this education, I'm wasting it following a bunch of jokers. He said, you're going to beg, but don't come to beg from me. Now he says, oh, yeah, 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 we kind of had foresight about it. You know, sometimes the carnal part of me wants to respond that for 40 years I tried to please you, and every time I got close, you showed rejection by moving the goalpost. The goalpost. I can tell you many more stories. Rejection is a painful thing. The Bible has many examples of people who suffered rejection. One of the men we admire the most in the Bible, David, he dealt with serious rejection. His father rejected him. His brothers rejected him. 
When the prophet came to the house to anoint the king and asked the father to bring out all his sons, the father paraded all the sons apart from David. David was inconsequential to the father. The prophet had to ask, is there any other son you have? Because God told the prophet, it's none of these. And then the father said, oh yeah, yeah, there's that character David. He's looking after sheep. David dealt with reje rejection. He was bound by, by a covenant to a group of men who came to meet him in a cave called Adulam. The Bible describes the men as the dregs of the, er of the earth, distressed, in debt, rejected men. He built them up, poured his life into them. The Bible testifies as to how well he did that by the testimony of the men when they became strong fighting men. And yet, when something went wrong and the enemy invaded their city and took their wives captive and burnt the city, those same men turned on him and threatened to kill him and stone him. That was deep rejection. David suffered rejection from someone who should have been there and happy for him at what God was doing. After the ark came into Jerusalem and he had danced with joy that God had come back to the city of David, he goes into his house to share the story with his wife and her face is like granite and she spits out at him. You displayed yourself like a fool before these maids. She rejected him at a time when he needed her to say well done. But then the story I wanted to tell you wasn't about David. It's about a, a, a lady that I have come to know quite well. A lady whose story really touched my heart because if there's any story I have heard about the pain of rejection, it surely must be this lady's story. She was born into a family, family of two. She had a sister. When she was born, she had the aspirations of any young lady. She wanted to get married, be loved by her husband, have children, you know, and just live a, a good life. But then when she was born, she was born with some physical ailment, some physical, it wasn't really a defect, it wasn't a disability, but something that marred her looks physically. There was something wrong, people would say, with her eyes. Those who were polite would say that her eyes were delicate. Those who were not so polite would say that her eyes were weak. And then those who were downright rude would say that her eyes were droopy. And with this state, she was born into this place. She had a sister who was, who was just drop-dead gorgeous. She was beautiful. Her figure was stunning. She just stood out. And she noticed as she started to grow up that her father kind of kind of favored the sister over her. She began to sense that her father was concerned that she wouldn't get married. Because who would marry her with these droopy, weak, or if you want to be polite, delicate eyes? Especially when she was going to be compared to her sister who was stunning physically. Her story is actually written in the Bible, Genesis, the 29th chapter. Her name is Leah. Her sister was Rachel. One day, a young man comes to the house. Both sisters are hopeful that they might marry this young man. His name is Jacob. He actually happened to be their cousin. In those days, it was okay for cousins to marry each other. And when Jacob comes there, after living in their house for a month, Jacob makes it known to the father that he would like to marry 
the younger sister, Rachel. And the father agrees, but the father was a, a trickster. Jacob thought he was, but he met his match in certain areas with his uncle Laban. And so the father agrees, and on the night of the marriage, the father goes and calls his daughter Leah. I, I just can't imagine what that, that lady's psyche was like. I want to marry you off, but it has to be by subterfuge. Because if we don't do it by subterfuge, nobody's going to marry you. So when Jacob thinks the marriage has been con conducted and it's time for the wife to go in, I'm going to take you and sneak you in. And you're going to sleep with him, and then he's going to be bound to marry you. What does that do for a woman's psyche? That he can't marry me because of who I am? That we have to do something underhand just to get me married? Father, is that what you think of me? Is that how low you think I am? That you have to sneak me into a man's bed just so that I can become a wife? That spoke volumes to her of rejection from her father, of favoritism for her sister. But Laban works it out. He takes her in. She obeys her father as, would, as she would do then. And in the morning, after sleeping with her in the night, Jacob wakes up and realizes it's the wrong person. What, what, what did Jacob say? Genesis 29 verse 25. So it came to pass in the morning that behold it was Leah and he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? For seven years he had served him for Rachel. He ended up with Leah. The New Living Translation puts it like this and you get, a, you get an idea of the rejection that Leah must have suffered that morning. It must have wounded her deep in her psyche. And someone here knows what I'm talking about. When someone you love rejects you, walks off with another woman, if you're a woman. I genuinely canceled someone where the person she was married to walked off with another man. She was, she was traumatized. She said to me, P.I., I get, I could even cope if it, was, if it was another woman. I can even judge myself against her. He walked off with a man. Where do I begin? The rejection that that speaks. Where you've given yourself into a relationship. You had plans for marriage. And then one day, the person gets up and says, it's not working, it's over. The rejection. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, the Bible says, it was Leah. What have you done to me? Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? You can only imagine the look of shock on Jacob's face. The look of disappointment that sent a message to Leah. The anger, the Bible calls it a rage. And all this directed at Leah. The disgust when he wakes up and it's not Rachel that is sleeping, to, sleeping next to him. All these and more would have released fiery arrows of rejection into the core of Leah's being. But her pain wasn't over. When Jacob went to Laban, Laban said, well, it's done. You've slept with her. She's your wife. But then if you can wait until your bridal week is over, if you promise to work for another seven years for me, then I will give you Rachel as your wife. And he promised to do so. 
every one of those seven years would have been an arrow. Every day would have been an arrow of rejection shot at Leah. And you know, Jacob couldn't help himself. He loved Leah to distraction. The Bible says in verse 20, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. You know, you can't graphically describe love in a better way. The man worked for seven years and he thought it was four days because he loved her so much. And what do you think was happening all that time? He would have been expressing his love to her, showing his favoritism. And all the time, every expression of love to Rachel would have been an arrow, a fiery dart of rejection that was shot in Leah's di direction. And the pain of this was that she probably was suffering this rejection because of something in her, in her body, because her eyes were droopy. No one thought about finding out about her character, her personality. Because her sister's stunning physique. The Bible says in verse 17, the New Living Translation, there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Trust me, if the Bible says a beautiful figure, trust me, it was serious. And ladies, you might not understand it, but let me talk to some guys. Trust me, it was serious. Forget Beyonce. It was serious. And so she lives with this, her sister who's stunning. Her figure is the drop dead kind of figure. And her eyes are droopy or weak. And if the Bible says she had a beautiful figure and doesn't say Leah had a beautiful figure, I leave to your imagination what Leah's figure would have been. And so Leah decides that I have to deal with this rejection. And she decides that the way to deal with it is to try and please the man. Mistake number one. So the Bible says from verse 31 to 35, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, she was unloved, she was unwanted, she was rejected. He opened her womb, but Rachel was bar barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. She thought, I have a child for him. Hopefully, he will now turn away from rejecting me and start to love me because I've satisfied him with a child. It says, now the Lord has looked on my affliction. She saw her life as being afflicted. The Amplified Version says, on my humiliation and suffering. She was humiliated by the re rejection. She saw herself as suffering. The New International Version says, on my misery. So she saw her life as miserable. And there are so many who uh, have suffered rejection, who are going through some misery, who feel that there's some affliction. The wound has cut, cut deep. The memory won't go away. The pain is being carried. I meet women who have come through a divorce, or men in some cases, and the bitterness with which they talk about it. And then I say, when did this thing take place? They say 11 years ago. I'm thinking, wow, 11 years ago, and you still feel the pain like it happened this morning. It's the arrow of rejection. I meet young girls who have a, a hatred for authority figures. And then I find out that it's because of how their father treated them. She said, my affliction, my misery, my suffering, my humiliation. She says, now at least I have a son. He's Reuben. Hopefully my husband will love me. But it didn't work. Then she goes and conceives again. And the Bible says she bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called him Simeon. God knows I'm unloved. So God has given me, she thought, the answer to being unloved. 
if I can do this for this person, then hopefully my situation will change. Can I tell you that no human being can solve the problem of rejection? All people will do is keep moving the goalpost, and you will never do enough for an, another human being to turn their heart around. And when that fails, she, she tries a third time. The Bible says she conceives again and bore a son. And now she said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. She says, surely this has to work. I've given him three sons. And you know what she was thinking? I've given him three sons. Rachel hasn't given him a single child. Surely he must become attached to me. If you look for the solution in the natural, you will end up in frustration. And that fails. When she gave birth to Levi, it didn't work. He wasn't attached to her. With three sons, he was still spending more time with Rachel, still sleeping more, more nights with Rachel, still showing Rachel more affection, and yet she had three sons for him. And then something happened to her. And I'm praying that what happened to her will happen to anyone under the sound of my voice who has had to deal with rejection. She suddenly realized that it has nothing to do with him. He will never take this pain away. He's incapable of healing these wounds. On the contrary, he was part of what caused these wounds. I have to turn my attention to the only one who is capable. And then she had a fourth child, a fourth son. And she said, now, this is what she did. She called the fourth son Judah. That, 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 the name showed her state of mind. Because first, it was affliction, humiliation, shame, and misery. Secondly, it was, uh, I'm unloved. Thirdly, it was, now he has to be attached to me. But the fourth one, something had happened to her mind. And she says, it's not about him. This fourth one is called Judah. Judah means, now I will praise the Lord. And then the Bible says, and then she stopped bearing. The fourth child that came showed us her state of mind. That she realized it's not about you, Jacob. My sustenance doesn't come from you. My worth doesn't come from you. My esteem doesn't come from you. You don't know how much you've hurt me, but I forgive you. I turn my attention to God. This fourth child is a gift from God. I call this fourth child praise. Now I will praise the Lord. In my circumstances, I will praise the Lord. You rejected me, I will praise the Lord. My eyes are droopy, I will praise the Lord. And as a result of that, something had happened in her heart. And isn't it instructive, the message that God gives us? Because you see, they say most people will. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. That's for normal human beings. God chooses his family. Out of all the 12 children that were born to Jacob, born to Leah, born to Leah's maid, born to Rachel, born to Rachel's maid, 12 children, the, entire, the 12 tribes of Israel. When it was time for God to choose the child through which his son will come, he didn't choose Reuben. That's what I thought he would choose. Reuben was the first child. He didn't even choose Levi that eventually became the priesthood. He went to the fourth child. He didn't choose Rachel's children. Despite all that Joseph did, Benjamin, he didn't choose them. He went to the fourth child. He was sending a message to Leah and a message to those 2,000 years, 4,000 years later who would be living with rejection that if you turn to me, I will choose you. The Bible says in Genesis 49 verse 10, the New Living Translation, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. And isn't it interesting 
that that scepter continued from Judah and continued all the way to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I came to tell someone that people might have rejected you, but God has not rejected you. He has chosen you, redeemed you, and he has sent a clear message that they didn't know what they were doing in rejecting you. For he chose Leah's fourth son, Judah, to come into the earth. Can someone say amen? amen. A couple of things about rejection. For those of us who are dealing with it. Number one, you must confront the reality of rejection. You mustn't live in denial. I've met too many people who live in denial. I know people who are close to me. They never talk about their past. Isn't that abnormal? Because in their past are things to do with rejection and what I might talk about next week, things that they are ashamed about. So you laugh with them, you talk with them, you eat with them, but if somebody asks you, where are they coming from? Who are they really? You don't know. It's almost like they want to reinvent themselves because of what has happened in the past. It always tells me they haven't dealt with it. Because you see, when you've dealt with it, it becomes a testimony. I can tell you my story of rejection because it's a testimony. I've dealt with it. Otherwise, I will hide it and present to you what I want to present to you. I've met people who are living in denial. I've met people who exaggerate who they are. And all this is because they are dealing, there's so much rejection that has not been dealt with. If I can't share my testimony, then it means I haven't dealt with the mess that was, the re that should have been the result of the testimony. Look at what God says to Jeremiah, and you will know that God just does not like pity parties. Jeremiah, the 15th chapter and the 19th verse in the Amplified Version, the New Amplified Version. Therefore, thus says the Lord to Jeremiah, if you repent and give up this mistaken attitude of despair and self-pity, God says it's a mistaken attitude of despair and self-pity. He says, change your mind. Don't get into this pity party. This is God speaking. God is love, but God is speaking. He says, then I will restore you to a state of inner peace. He says, stop throwing that pity party for yourself. It happened. Wake up and deal with it. I can give you the grace to deal with it if you will come up and confront it. He says, then I will give you I will restore to you a state of inner peace so that you may stand before me as my obedient representative. And if you separate the precious from the worthless, examining yourself <coughs> and cleansing your heart from unwarranted doubt concerning my faithfulness. God says that you were rejected does not change who I am. He says, chase that doubt out of your mind. It is unwarranted doubt. It's, God says it's needless. It's a snare. It's a lie of the enemy. He says, then you will become my spokesman. Let the people turn to you and learn to value my values. But you must not turn to them with regards to idolatry. God says, don't throw the pity party. Enough of it. The enemy wants you to stay there, inviting more people. Come to my pity party. Come to my pity party. God says, repent. C come to me. I can give you inner peace. Can someone say amen? amen? Number two, see yourself as God sees you. The world is divided into the truth and the lie and the lies. Choose which one you believe. My father used to tell me that I was, I, he, my father told me I was going nowhere. On one occasion, my father told, told my mother that he, he's, he must be on drugs. Actually, I can't blame him because I was, I was rebellious. My rebellion was against what he thought of me.
But I came to Christ and found out that I'm not. I found out, like the psalmist says in Psalms 139 verse 14, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The psalmist says in that psalm, I will praise you. Somebody should say that. I will praise you. Go on, say it one more time. I will praise you. And why will I praise you? Because despite the divorce, despite the betrayal, despite the negative words from a parent who should have loved me but instead cut me down with their words, despite the career that hasn't started, despite the failed interviews, despite the failed exams, despite the physical ailment, I suddenly have realized that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And so I can say, marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. But you see, your soul can't know it well if you haven't found where he said it. If you haven't opened the book to find out what he says about you in the book, if you haven't read it, you haven't meditated upon it until it becomes a part of you. So that anytime anybody shoots an arrow at you, what do you raise? You raise what the book says about you. That's what the Bible calls faith. I trust what God says. I don't trust what you say. So you are a liar because God can't tell a lie. So I am who God says I am, not who you say I am. Number three. You must know that God has a plan and a purpose for you. You're not an accident. Your parents met even if they never got married. That's why God does not have illegitimate children. That's a creation of man. The moment you are adopted into his family, you can cry, Abba, Father, the same way as the, as the person who was brought up in the nice family with mother and father and two and a half children, one and a half dogs and three and a half cars and uh, living, well, whatever. Yeah, and I was brought up in a totally dysfunctional home. I don't even know my father. I've never met my father. This is not two, this is not two people. It's just one person who has brought me up. The home is highly dysfunctional. But the moment I am adopted into his family, it's okay. Because you call him Abba Father, I call him Abba Father. My spirit confirms to me that I am no, no longer illegitimate. I am now a child of God. I have a father. And so I know God has a plan and a purpose for me. My parents had to meet each other. Not because my father loved my mother. He says he did. But because God wanted to bring me into this world for his plan and purpose for my life. So they met because of me. They owe me gratitude. Because if not because of me, they would never have met. So he says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, the New Living Translation, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Number four, God wants you healed. He wants to take away the pain of rejection. He wants to cleanse by his blood the poison of rejection. The psalmist says in Psalms 147 verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That is what he does. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this about him. This is our high priest, Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I love the amplified version, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations. He understands exactly what we are going through. But one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human, he understands, my sister, where you are. In every respect, as we are yet without committing any sin, he didn't commit the sin of grumbling or mumbling against God. Therefore, let us with privilege, with privilege, with privilege it is a privilege approach the throne of grace that is the throne of God's gracious favor with confidence and without fear so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help 
in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. Somebody is going to get the blessing of deliverance at this moment. And when the Bible says we don't have a priest who is unable to sympathize and empathize with us, sometimes we misunderstand the price that he paid so that he can say, I get it to God. I understand it. I know what she's feeling as a result of that, 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 that rejection. I know how she's feeling the pain of that divorce. I know what it feels like for that child to reject all his love or her love. He says, I know. Look at how the prophet Isaiah describes him. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter and the third verse. He says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Please, he understands a low self-esteem. For we did not esteem him. We put him lower than the lowest self-esteem. Says we rejected him and despised him. He gets what it is to be rejected and despised. Says we, he, for us, he became a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was rejected by his family. John the seventh chapter and the fifth verse. The Bible says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. The pain of rejection when those who you expect should be cheering you, those who you expect should be speaking words that build you up, those who you expect should be in your corner, turn against you, reject you. It says his brothers did not believe in him. His brothers thought he was an imposter. His brothers thought he was a con man. His brothers thought he was being deceitful. His own brothers. It was painful, but he went through it so that he can say to you, I understand when your family rejects you. He was rejected by his community, the people he grew up with. When he went back there in Matthew, the 13th chapter from the 53rd verse, the people just disdained him completely. They called him this man. Where did this man get this wisdom and this mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Are his sisters not here with us? Are his brothers not James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? And then guess what? They got offended at him. And I can imagine Jesus saying, but what have I done? I only came back here to be used by God here. I came to serve. Why are you offended at me? What have I done? And then listen beyond the words to the cry of his heart when he says a prophet is without honor except in his own country and in his own house his heart was wounded he was rejected by the people he came to save one week before they're crying hosanna thank god he did not believe these people and please be careful of praise singers. They are crying Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. As he rides in on the donkey, they are taking off their clothes. Human nature, oh my God. My father says something. He says, Agu, if you live long enough, you will see everything. From, from an 80-something-year-old man, he tells me that he has seen a lot in life. They were taking off their clothes and they were laying it on the path of the donkey. How much more could you prove that you love this man? Adulation and worship and praise. Exactly one week later, they had a choice. Should we release Jesus or release Barabbas? Barabbas was a notorious criminal, a thief, a robber, a murderer. They knew. Guess what that same crowd said? Release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. He was rejected by the people he came to save. But easily the most painful rejection to him. Nine hours after he had been crucified, for three hours, in a, in, a, in a way that we can't explain, 
Darkness, thick darkness had covered the earth as he was hanging on the cross. Some would say that what he was going through was too painful for God to see, so God blanketed the whole earth in darkness. Three hours after that darkness, nine hours after he had been crucified, he tried to reach his father. He tried to call out to him. He suddenly noticed that for the first time in his life, he, he couldn't hear his father's voice. It dawned on him that his father had turned his back on him, rejecting him. The cry that went out from his lips, please, is one we must not take lightly. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you rejected me? Why did God reject him? Because he needed to pay that price, the ultimate price for rejection. So that when he now comes as the healer of the rejected soul, he has paid the price and can heal you of the pain of your rejection. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you. Lord, we bless you. My prayer is that there's no one here who's wounded in their psyche by rejection that will live here the same. That God will do a deep healing work in your life. That you won't run this weight. You won't run this race with weights strapped around your ankles. The writer of Hebrews says, lay aside the weight that you may run this race. Sweet Holy Spirit, we're going to trust you that during ministry time, you will heal in this place. And if there's anyone who hasn't taken the first step of inviting the, this healer into their lives, you haven't given your life to Jesus, if you would slip your hands up wherever you are. Anybody saying, please pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus online. I want to give my life to Jesus. Slip your hands up wherever you are. Anybody saying, please pray for me. Father, we thank you. Lord, we bless you. <coughs> give you all the praise. Anybody saying please pray for me? I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Please slip the hand up. Slip the hand up. I see that hand. Can, can card be put? I need, I need some, uh, some of our, our ministers, members of our team. Um, I need a gentleman. A gentleman. Yeah. Anybody else? Slip that hand up. Phil. Slip that hand up. Anybody else? Um, if, a, if a member of our, our, our team comes up to you, one of the pastors, they'll, they'll, they'll take you out to a room and chat with you for a while. Father, we just thank you. The rest of us, bow your heads for a minute and just talk to God. Tell him to search by the spirits, the deepest part of your being. And if there's anything that is preventing you from being wholesome, anything that you suffered in the past relating to rejection, that might have let, let you live with an esteem that is not what he has said you are, then ask God to do a healing work. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come and talk to him for a minute or two. Thank you, Father. Father, we bless you, O God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Look, look up at me for a second. Um, what I'm doing in this series, because I know ministry is critical. Um, you want someone to pray with you, to stand with you, to join you in agreement, that, and, and to pray that the Spirit of God will move and take away that pain. You see, this thing is spiritual. 
you deal with it spiritually and then we have avenues for you to walk for us to walk with you out of it uh, we have trained counselors uh, who, are, who are trained and sometimes the wound is so deep that counseling is needed uh, we have mentoring schemes for the young ladies, the EMS mentoring scheme that Funke runs. Uh, we have mentoring schemes. We have one-on-one -on -one mentoring schemes as well for guys. So people can hold your hand because you see, there's nothing like somebody who's been there holding your hand and walking with you. But before all that happens, the spiritual stranglehold of the enemy must be broken. And so after the service, the pastors and the deacons and deaconesses will be up, up front and we're, we're going to have time to spend ministering to people one-on-one. -on -one. The idea is that those who don't need to can leave, and then those who want to be ministered to prayed with, prayed for. Um, and maybe for one or two cases, uh, a counselor is, is asked to take it on, or a mentoring scheme is recommended either in here or out here. Uh, we'll do that. But we'll pray for you. We'll join faith with you. We'll break the hold of the enemy over you. Uh, and we encourage you to go and stand in the word of God. The fiery darts are extinguished because you have a shield of faith. The shield of faith is built by the word of God. You know who you are in the word of God. You know God's plan for you in the word of God. Everything is in that book. It is fully of the highest order not to spend every day in that book. Reading, studying, meditating, and then eventually starting to confess. Because what you speak with your mouth is what you become. You frame, the, you frame your world with your words. Words make, words make things happen. You frame your world. You create your world. We have a part of the divine in us. He spoke the world into being. We can speak our world into being. But we don't use our own words. We use his words. We speak his words. And his words come into being. That's why Jesus said, these words are not common words. It's not Shakespeare. It's not Tolsky or, or any of the great writers. It's nothing to do with that. It's not, it's not a great motivational speaker. Those things are okay to the extent that they help. But Jesus says these words are different. He says these words, they have spirit and life. The DNA of these words. So when they are spoken, they go to achieve what they should. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. But to be able to speak it, you have to have read it. You have to know it. To, for it to sink into your subconscious and become a part of your DNA, you have to have meditated on it. It is fully, fully of the highest order not to be studying the Word of God every single day. Go and give God a clap of it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be worshiping the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And so while you prepare your tithes and your offerings, we'll be just standing upon one word of scripture. We do say this and we encourage this is a free will offering. We encourage you to give to the Lord, not only because he commands it, but he adds a blessing with it. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8 verse 22, while the Lord was re-establishing fruitfulness on the earth, he said the following. He said, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, day and night, summer and winter, they will never cease. And so ladies and gentlemen, as you give today, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will come upon you, the grace that moves you from a place of poverty to a place of abundance so you have not only enough for your needs but enough to meet the ones that are coming and enough to be generous so that you can not only be a blessing but you can fulfill what God wants you to do and so ladies and gentlemen as I leave you in the safe hands of the choir my prayer is very simple that may God's grace the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest and abide upon you today as you give.
Father, we honor you with our offering today, O oh God. But more importantly, from the bottom of our hearts, we just say thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we have in you, Lord Jesus. Thank you once again for the sacrifice on the cross, that you bore it all, that we might be free, O oh God. And even by reason of your word today, may freedom come to each one of us, O oh God. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' name we have worshipped. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the wonderful presence of God. As we bring the service to a close, we'd just like to embellish a number of the announcements. Now, ladies, um, it's just under two weeks to one of the highlights of the year, the Uncommon Woman Conference, which is always a life-changing life transforming um, experience and encounter and we encourage you to look forward expectantly to this year's edition of the Uncommon Woman Conference. I have said, oh sorry I beg your pardon, five, five weeks, not two weeks. Um, it's in May, not April, I beg your pardon. Um, and um, I, I was saying in the first service that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a firm believer that when God by His Spirit gives a theme for an event, a gathering. It's an indication of what he wants to do. And this year, as we've heard quite a number of times, the theme for this year's conference is Inspire. And trust in God that by his spirit, that is exactly what he will do. That he'll trans transform us, translocate us, and inspire us into his plans and purposes. Amen? Um, so I want to encourage you to look forward to it. Now, um, all the ladies, we want to give you uh, the leaflet for the conference it serves as your invitation to the event ushers can i ask you to please give every single lady woman in this house a flyer um, so please take these flyers they serve primarily as your invitation but then we'd like to ask you to also use it to invite other women that are not either here in church or members of this congregation because as you've heard, the conference is open to ladies all over. So please um, look forward to this event. And I um, wanted to encourage you to also start to register. As you know, there's a fee to registration. 
But I say this particularly because um, for the ladies who are under the age of 21, um, your entrance fee is half of the, the normal price, 15 pounds. But then this morning, we gathered that one of the ladies generously purchased 20 free tickets to be given to any lady under 21 who is unable, unable to afford. Yeah, go on, let's, ap let's appreciate the generosity of... So for the ladies under 21, um, you can't afford the 15 pound registration fee. There are 20 free spaces. You're welcome to go to the desk and just say, can I have one of those free tickets? For the rest of us, um, particularly the older ladies, please register on time and look forward to what will be an amazing conference by the grace of God. And then, but before then, um, the monthly meeting for the ladies, the Esther's monthly prayer meeting, will be taking place this Saturday, the 21st. It's for one hour between 6.30 and 7.30 in the morning but then you pray online so you can pray from home wherever you are. So please look forward to the monthly prayer meeting Saturday the 21st. And then also for the Esther's 18 to 30 ladies, um, your monthly meeting this month, this Thursday on the uh, 19th of April is going to be special because it's going to be your book club and I gather, I was talking to Pastor Shola uh, Miruku, I gather that um, there's this fantastic, amazing book that you're going to be looking at called Kazon. It's actually a book that is derived from, the, the name is derived from the wisdom of God in Hebrew. And um, the, the, the book presents practical advice for discovering your God-given purpose. And it's something to look forward to. So ladies... 18 to 30. Uh, look forward to that meeting on the 19th of April. For all those who have indicated that they would like to serve in the numerous ministries that undergird this church, our training uh, to equip our volunteer workers will start this Tuesday, the 17th of April at 7 p.m. in the chapel. So please look forward to that, a series of training to equip us. But then if there's anyone who's just hearing this for the first time, you didn't know that we were asking people to volunteer uh, um, into, to, to serve in the ministries, you're welcome to join the training when it starts on Tuesday the 17th by God's grace. And lastly, um, our Abigail Scott, which is our ministry that ministers to and serves the elderly community out in, 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 in the uh, community. As you know, they have a flagship event every year, which is called Celebrating Life, where they invite um, the older generation, a lot of them from old people's homes. We bring them into this facility and then just give them a, a pleas pleasant celebration of life event on the day. They are preparing towards this year's event, which will take place on the 21st of July, Saturday 21st. But then, as most of us know, they usually come to us asking for, for us to support in terms of donations to be able to bring the event to pass. One of the ways they do that is the famous cake sale out in the foyer. So this is to let you know that cakes are available out in the foyer. And um, we'd like to encourage you to go out, buy a cake, knowing that as you enjoy the cake, the proceeds are going to ensuring that we're providing a lovely event for our elderly people on the 21st of July. Amen. And then um, please make sure you join a connect group. The only way to grow meaningfully is when we come together in small groups and we look deeper into the Word of God. The Word that has been shared this morning, for example, on Wednesday at our connect group, we sit down in small groups and look into the Word some more. And that's how we grow. So if you don't already belong to a connect group, please make sure you find one, either close to your home, close to your place of work, or, or close to your uni. Um, if you go out to the desk, the front desk, there will be a table out there and you can find out the closest connect group to you. 
Amen. And then lastly, um, just so I don't forget, the series of prayer walks over the next four Sundays will start next Sunday, as Pastor Agu mentioned. The starting place is Tottenham, um, one of the hottest spots where a lot of the violence has taken place. And we will be doing the prayer walk from the Tottenham Town Hall. So we meet at the Tottenham Town Hall and prayer walk for an hour. So we're asking people to arrive at 3.30 p.m., please, because the prayer walk will start at 4 p.m. on the dot, just for one hour up till 5. And by God's grace, we will take that area back for God. Amen? Hallelujah. Is there anyone that it's your first time worshiping with us this afternoon? And the reason why I ask is that we would like to acknowledge your presence and thank you for coming to be with us. Can I ask you if it's your first time to just wave at me wherever you are? If it's your first time, anybody, I can see those hands. God bless you. Thank you for coming to be with us. Go on, church, let's celebrate our new guests. We want to thank them for coming. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's keep clapping for them. Can I invite you, our new guests, to just rise up and go to our hospitality room. We've got an informal reception for you. Thank you ever so much for coming. And can we also appreciate our online congregation? Go on. I appreciate them. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. Hallelujah. Let's rise up to our feet as we end the service. Please don't forget, if you would like to be ministered to along the lines that we have heard this, this afternoon, you've been suffering rejection in one way or the other, Please feel free to come up to the front as soon as we finish. The ministers will be out here waiting for you. If you are not being ministered to, you're welcome to go home. Father, we thank you once again. We're grateful that you are a father who cares, a father who loves us more than we can imagine. We're also grateful that your plans concerning us are always for good. And that's why we are confident that by reason of your word, there will be deliverance today, O oh God. So we ask you by your spirit, O oh God, because it can only be by your spirit, that you will set every single person that has been held bound by the spirit of rejection to set them free today, O oh God. Father, even by reason of our faith in you, we quench those fiery darts in the mighty name of Jesus. We declare that only your plans and purposes will prosper in our lives. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Please come forward if you'd like to be ministered to. God bless you as you do, sir. The side turned, turned. I need the pastors and the, yeah, spread out a bit, spread out a bit. Go on, you can go, go straight. If you want to be prayed for, then come forward from wherever you are. If you want to be prayed for, come.